Welcome everyone. I'm Chris Fuller. I'm the Vice President, uh, uh, Chief Sponsorship and Mission Integration Officer here at St. Joseph's College of Maine. And this is Mercy Week, the week during which we honor and celebrate our founding by the Sisters of Mercy in 1912. And each week, we, uh, each week, each year, we focus on one of the critical concerns of the sisters, one of their five concerns. Last year was anti-racism, and this year it is the critical concern of women. Uh, my guest for this conversation is Donna Loring. <clears throat> Donna is a member of the Penobscot Indian Nation in Maine. She spent her childhood years on Indian Island, Maine, where she was raised by her grandmother. In 1966, she joined the Women's Army Corps, and from November of 1967 to November of 1968, she served as communications specialist at Long Bin Army Base, north of Saigon. After returning from Vietnam, she graduated from the University of Maine at Orono with a Bachelor of Arts in Political Science. She graduated from Maine Criminal Justice Academy in 1978 and served as police chief for the Penobscot Nation from 1984 to 1990. In 1992, she became the first women director of security at Bowdoin College, a position she held until 1997. She also served as an advisor to Governor Angus King on Women Veterans Affairs. From 1998 to 2003, and again from 2007 to 2008, she served as the Penobscot Nation's representative to the Maine State Legislature. And during her time there, she authored and sponsored LD 291, an act to require teaching Maine Native American history and culture in Maine schools, which was signed into law in 2001. She also conceptualized and advocated for the first State of the Tribes Address in Maine history in 2002. And in April 2008, she put before the legislature HP 1681, joint resolution in support of the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, this passed unanimously, making Maine the only state in the country to pass such a resolution in favor of the UN Declaration of Indigenous Rights. Loring later served as a selected person for the town of Richmond. She attended the Fleming Fellows Leadership Institute and the Eleanor Roosevelt Global Leadership Institute. In 1999, she was given the Mary Ann Hartman Award, which recognizes Maine women for accomplishments in the arts, politics, business, education, and community services from the Women in Curriculum and Women's Studies Program at the University of Maine. In 2019, Governor Janet Mills appointed her as Senior Advisor on Public Affairs to the Governor, a post she held until 2020. Donna hosts a monthly radio show called Wabanaki Windows for WERU in Blue Hill, Maine. She has long written about policy in Maine Indian history, but in recent years, she has turned to creative writing, publishing a memoir about her years in the Maine legislature called In the Shadow of the Eagle in 2008. And, in, and she has also written a musical drama called, uh, and correct me Don if I get this wrong, The Gloosecape Chronicles, Creation and the Venetian Basket. And finally, her papers are housed at the University of New England. So welcome Donna Loring to the conversation tonight. Thank you for joining us. <clears throat> Thank you for inviting me. Well, this week is, um, like I said, we're focusing on the Sisters of Mercy critical concern of women. And I've asked, uh, as I said, some women to join me this week for conversations who um, are leaders, have been leaders in Maine on a number of issues, and you certainly fit the bill there. I, I want to start uh, at the beginning with you, and that is um, no one becomes a leader in a vacuum. They have uh, people who encourage them, stand behind them, communities that encourage them, form them. So where did it start for you? What, what generated, if you will, the trajectory that kind of drew you into leadership, especially you're, you're someone who has described yourself as an introvert. So I, I, would, <laughs> yes, I, am. I guess it would take, you know, a, 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 a lot of encouragement to kind of move you in the direction of leadership. So where did it begin with you? Hmm. Um, hard to say, I, 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 I would have to, if I went way, way back, it would be with my, my, uh, my father who served as a, uh, in with the 10th Mountain Division in Germany. And he would always t tell stories about his experience uh, in World War II in the Po Valley. And this one story he always told was how he recognized there were uh, German soldiers coming down the hill and they, uh, were carrying white flags and they had their arms up and there was a, 
a whole bunch of them coming down with their arms in the air. And he saw that they had weapons behind them. And he he gave everyone, you know, a, a warning and everyone hit the dirt and, and you know, kind of saved a bunch of, of his uh, fellow soldiers. And at the end of that, a lieutenant came up to him, or actually a, was a, more, more of a higher rank, I can't remember the rank, but the officers uh, offered him a field commission to lieutenant. And he was, a, I think he was a corporal at the time, and he turned it down. He said, I, I don't want to do that. And that story kind of stayed with me for, for my life. And I, I determined that if I was ever offered a promotion or a chance to get ahead, I would not turn it down. So uh, you might that might be where I, I started. Mm. I, I, the, you know, I've also, uh, in watching some um, videos that are interviews with you, you've also talked about the role of not only your grandmother, but grandmothers in Penobscot uh, culture. Um, could you share a little bit with us about um, that the ways in which your grandmother may have shaped you or again, the, the, the larger role of grandmothers within your, your tribal culture? Um, well, the, the women in our culture are very, um, they're the center of the culture. They run everything. Um, <laughs> I mean, the facade is that, you know, you have a male chief um, and, but no, the women, the women run the community and uh back in uh, before the europeans came and uh, took over uh t in order for a chief to be chosen uh, the tribes would come together and when the penobscots chose their chief the other tribes had influence in who the chief was and they would all come from all over to choose the chief and if they didn't choose the right person that the women felt uh, they should have, then they would they would hide their paddles and they wouldn't be able to leave until they made the right decision. <laughs> you don't mess with Wabanaki women. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, and, and you know, I'd say that my grandmother um, was not Native. She was total. She was uh, totally uh, non-native. She was English, Scottish, Irish, um, and uh, her. When she married my grandfather, her family disowned her. Mm. Uh, so, um, but she was very religious and uh, very anti-Catholic. She was a Protestant, uh, what you might call it, a white Anglo-Saxon Protestant. Mm. Big time. Mm -hmm. uh, so she was a. Uh, I think she. Well, I think it was the uh, con conservative Baptist. At at that time, and um, she was the center of the family. She had like uh, ten kids. She was competing with the the Catholic women who had ten or eleven mm -hmm. kids. So. <laughs> so. So she had all these kids, all these grandchildren. Um, and she, she, she ran the family. If anybody wanted to uh, do something, they would talk to her and get her input. Um, they wouldn't do anything without her. Mm. She was, she was, she was the hub of the family. Mm. You mentioned your, 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 I think it was your father, right? Who served in the 10th mountain division or was it your grandfather? My your father. father. Mm -hmm. You yourself have served in the military. You served during Vietnam. Um, anything about that experience that you think helped shape you in terms of your leadership, the leadership traits you've developed? Well, I don't know if it's if it's leadership that I developed, but uh, it's it was a, it's an appreciation for the humanity of my people and the and the dehumanization that has to take place in order to kill. Uh, you know, when you're a soldier in, in the military, uh, you're trained to kill. It's as simple as that. And when you go to a, a, a foreign country to take it over, to colonize it, or whatever you want to call it, uh, you kill people. 
And in order for that to happen, you have to regard those people as not human. And you, you know, you call them names and you degrade them. And I, you know, I saw this happening over there. Um, and when I came back here, I realized that uh, I, I didn't, and I didn't, and I didn't realize it right off. Um, I was in the legislature when the when this epiphany came, but um, I returned to uh, Vietnam in 1995 for a visit. And uh, as I was, uh, they had this they had this village that they had constructed, and they had uh, uh, tiger tiger cells there was a replica of, of the cells that where they kept the uh, American and allied prisoners. And they had these replicas of these cells there. They also had sold uh, uh, American uh, patches to uniforms and lighters and uh, pieces of insignia. Uh, and so as I was, I went with, uh, with some friends. I went with uh, my, one of my very good friends, Rachel Talbot Ross was a leader, uh, first uh, African-American leader, you know, leadership position in the legislature. So she, I went with her and uh, Severin Bellavo, a bunch of other people. And um, so we were, we were walking through these places and, and I, I thought it was very strange. I would ask people, I would ask, oh, and they had this poster and it was a poster of um, these disfigured um, Vietnamese people, and they and they had this big Agent Orange sign on the poster, and that kind of uh, st stuck with me because when you would walk outside the hotel, you would see all. I guess this is common in many places in the world. You would see beggars, uh, but these beggars were, were disfigured, and uh, you could tell it was from. Uh, Agent Orange or whatever that chemical was. Uh, so, you know, I saw this and then uh, at night I would turn on the TV there and they happened to have um, the series on um, um, Vietnam. They had a Vietnam, a Vietnam series on uh, uh, the Nixon tapes or something like that. And, and that was on every night. Hmm. So uh, anyway, when I got back and I, when I finally ended up in the legislature, it, it struck me when I heard, when I, when I knew how important these policies were that the state was creating, uh, I realized that um, you need to understand that these policies and laws are affecting real people and human beings, especially when you talk about Wabanaki people and the and the communities of color in this state, you know, where people we have family, we have bills, we live just like everybody else. Uh, and uh, we were not treated that way. When you I would imagine there were quite a few um, hurdles you had to address when you joined the legislature uh, in terms of raising the very kinds of issues that you're discussing. So what what were some of those hurdles that you had to um, address or confront in terms of trying to move forward issues, policies, leg legislative, legislative initiatives relative to um, wa supporting Wabanaki culture? <clears throat> well, tribal representatives at that time um, still uh, have no vote. So we really, all we had was a uh, uh, our voice mm. and uh, persuasion, and the and you would really hope that you could change minds, and people, you know, you'd sort of hope that they had good hearts and good intentions, but and then you would you'd have to and you and you know I developed this because I had to the survival of my people depended on it. Um, you had to make your argument. What, is, what we call an elevator speech, like in five minutes, uh, because though they were busy, they had their stuff that uh, their priorities, and it certainly was not Indians. 
Um, and then the other thing you had to look out for was the, the well-intentioned who would really try to help but really hurt. So every kind of, every native bill that came down the pike, I had to look at, uh, along with my colleague at that time was Donald Soctoma uh, from Passamaquoddy. And we, we didn't, we didn't vote, um, but uh, we could put in bills that uh, directly affected us, Indian people. Um, we could also argue on the floor debate, but uh, we, you know, we couldn't vote. We would get, uh, from time to time, we'd get notes out in the legislature. I don't know if you're aware of what happens there, but uh, each, your colleagues or whatever will write you notes to tell you, are you going to vote for this? How do you think I should vote? You know, you're writing back and forth these notes and they have these little high school kids or whatever, the elementary kids running with, with the notes in between the seats. And uh, so that's part of it. Uh, but, uh, you know, it was a, was a whole new kind of world that I stepped into. And the representative who I replaced had resigned the first, after the first year. So I stepped in the second year uh, where they handled only emergency bills, but I didn't, I had no idea what was going on. Absolutely not. Um, and that's why I started writing my, I wrote a journal and then I thought, well, I should, I should, this is important stuff. And my reason for writing it was to save it for the representatives that come after me. And uh, as I, as I wrote, as days passed, as issues came up, I decided that these things the general public should know. So I decided to just write a book for the general public to read as well. Mm. Mm -hmm. So you mentioned, uh, I, so you 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 were talking about the the, um, the working on bills, and you made a you made a reference to the well intentioned, and I'd like to ask a question in that regard because um, I, I consider myself one of those well intentioned people. Um, when I came here to St. Joseph's, I was invited to be part of a group working on issues related to diversity, equity, and inclusion, and I would like to have believed at that time. Uh, having married a woman of color, that I was probably as close to these issues as I could be, and I have learned um, a whole lot of things that I didn't know I didn't know, and habits I didn't know I had, um, that I have learned from some of my colleagues who are with us tonight, and my conversation with my wife. Um, so with regard, as you said, the well-intentioned, what do, what do we often miss when it comes to tribal issues, in, in spite of our good intentions? How do our good intentions, you mentioned even perhaps even getting in the way or undermining efforts. Um, what, so what, what are we missing in that regard? Hard to say. I mean, you, you guys, you're missing everything. <laughs> <laughs> you, got, you, you have to, I don't, I don't know how to, how to answer that question, yeah. I, I, except to say that uh, you have to be sort of, immersed in that culture, to, in, in that community to understand. And each community is different. They each have different needs. Um, we had, uh, first there was a bill that, uh, um, I don't know if I'm gonna name names here, but I do in my book, by the way. Um, this one guy, one, he was a senator, and he decided that um, the, the tuition that Indian kids would get, they get free tuition for college, that uh, that was probably unfair. And that uh, there should be, if you're gonna do a tuition for you know, the Indians and you gotta do it for everybody else, and you know, why should the Indians have special rights? And that's, that was the, key word, special rights, always. Uh, so the, uh, I did a little research because he was talking about how expensive it was for the state. And I went up to him and I said, 
you know, these special scholarships that you want to get rid of. If you want to, if you get rid of the Indian scholarships, then be ready to get rid of the firemen scholarships, the widow scholarships, uh, and the veteran scholarships. Compared to all of those, Native scholarships are only like less than 1% of all of that. So he, he, he didn't follow up on it. Mm. Uh, where, uh, you, you, when you were there was when they passed the law uh, about teaching Native American history in main schools. What, what, I, that, it, I, I, I wrote that law. You wrote that law, yes. I wrote that law. Oh, you wrote the law that that was that that became. Yes. You know, you, you wrote the bill that became law. Yes. What's the status of that right now in terms of how well, far how far has the state come implementing it? Yeah, here's the thing with, with that law. When I was trying to get it through, and I tell the story in my book, when I was trying to get that law through, um, it was put in. So it, came, it had to go in front of the education committee. And at the time, the education education committee uh, couldn't unanimously agree on anything. And in order for my bill uh, to pass, I really needed a unanimous from that committee. Because if this thing was debated, we'd lose. So um, the, 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 the education bill uh, they wanted to, to put it in as a mandate. And to this day, I hear people referring it and saying, well, you know, it's, if it's a mandate, then it's got to be paid for. Well, it's not a mandate. Because if I put it through as a mandate, they would never have approved it. So what it is, it's a requirement. And uh, it's a requirement that... Um, at the end of the day, I guess of the year or whatever, I think it was like a three year period for people to respond and evaluate and, and decide what they needed to teach uh, these courses in the schools. Um, but all, all of the schools, every school in Maine has not implemented it, hasn't implemented it to this day. And I hear, I hear people say, well, you know, that needs, that needs to be funded. We need to have more money for that. Well, that makes sense. But let me tell you something. That's a good intention. When you bring back a bill and you lay that bill in front of that legislature, be prepared because if somebody does not like it, they can kill it, they can change it, uh, they can just wipe it right off the books. And, you know, it took, it took us so long to to get this into schools, that I was not willing to put that out there uh, for that reason, for funding. Um, we agreed to fund, uh, the, the, the tribes kicked in some money, the university system kicked in some money, um, and that's how we got it passed. We, we agreed to pay so much money, uh, each, each entity. Uh, so, you know, it was not, it wasn't an easy thing to do. And I went, I, I lobbied every single member on that education committee uh, till finally I got them, I got a yes out of them. That's how that, that's how that happened. It wasn't, it wasn't easy. And I was told that it couldn't be done. And uh, it, it was hard. You're muted. Thank you. <laughs> what are some um, what are some remaining unresolved issues with regard to the legislature or the state of Maine and tribal communities? The unresolved issue, the big unresolved issue, starts with an S, and it's sovereignty. The state of Maine has refused to recognize the sovereignty of the tribes since we signed the treaty. As soon as that, before that ink was dry, in their minds, we were wards. We, they could do whatever they wanted with us as soon as we signed that treaty. Uh, so uh, yeah, that's the big issue. 
Mm. And people don't understand sovereignty. And to, and to a lot of people, it's a scary, it's a scary word. It's a scary issue. Mm -hmm. What, what, what would sovereignty or what does sovereignty look like then for, for the tribal communities here in Maine? Well, there was well, what, what constitutes sovereignty, I guess. Would be yeah, okay. Just got, well, sovereignty is actually the, uh, the God given right the creator's right, the God-given right, to govern yourself and your community, your town, your, your, your tribe, your... Um, so it, that's, the, that's the inherent right of a people to govern themselves. It's sovereignty um, is something that we have and we had 10,000 years ago before Europe, the Europeans came. Um, and it's something we have. It's something that cannot be taken. Uh, we can be stopped from exercising it and we can be controlled. But sovereignty is something that, that, uh, that we have. And, it, and in, in other states other than Maine, it's recognized. Uh, that was, gonna be, that was gonna be my next question is, is, yeah. is, is it recognized in other states? Yeah, I mean, Washington, it's a limited sovereignty, but Washington uh, state for years was a, had a big battle going on with, they, they had something like 31, 32 tribes in Washington state. And there was a big battle about salmon fishing. And uh, so you know, a guy named Slate Gordon was the, uh, the, the Darth Vader of that time uh, for Indians. Uh, but somehow he he got turned around. I don't know how that happened, but uh, Washington State is a great example of how a state can work with tribes and recognize the sovereignty. Um, they created a, uh, a centennial accord in, in an agreement with those tribes and how they would process things and how they would treat each other um, and that's working pretty well so what's the rationale here in maine then for for denying the tribes their sovereignty how about uh colonialism mm. how about that paradigm that says there will be no nation within a nation mm. you know that's a dog whistle nation within a nation now what the you know the first time i heard i i knew about that was in a speech, and I'm not this old, I'm just, <laughs> I just did some research. <laughs> it was a, a speech by uh, uh, Andrew Jackson, his first uh, presidential speech. And he was trying to uh, uh, take land away from the Cherokee because he promised Georgia that they could have all that land and uh, the Indians were in the way. And in, in his speech, he says, we can have no nations within a nation and he said, do you think that Maine would allow the Penobscots to mm -hmm. be a nation? He said that in his speech. So, I mean, we were on the radar screen even back then. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Well, yeah. you know, m many of my questions have focused on your uh, political career. But after you published your memoir, you turned to more artistic endeavors and you wrote a play. You wrote a musical play. So what is it that kind of moved you in that direction? kind of expanding your kind of creative outlets and expression to to try out uh, working in, in that arena? Well, as I mentioned before, you know, my experience in Vietnam uh, sort of taught me or showed me that the, my people had to be on the radar. We, we should be seen and and people should know who we are and what we do and that we're human and, you know, and we need to be seen and, and understood. So my book that I wrote didn't really do much for that. Um, and I also, in the legislature, um, I pushed for this uh, um, day that the, the, the chiefs could address the legislature. And it took me almost a year 
to get the speaker to agree to allow the, the chiefs to address the house. And once that happened, once he agreed, I said, oh, can we have a joint session, which would mean st uh, Senate and House. And he said, well, you'll have to get the president of the Senate to agree. And so I went to ask the president of the Senate and he said, well, let me think about it, which I had heard from the House. So um, eventually they, they agreed and we were seen. I mean, we were the, for the first time in almost 200 years, the chiefs were allowed to address a joint session of the legislature to talk to them and tell them about their issues and how they felt uh, the, it, they related to the state. So, and this was, it was such a, it was a big deal because it was on the radio, it was live on the radio. It was live on TV. Uh, you know, that was, they were seen. They were absolutely seen that day. But that, well, how long did that last? What, probably the next day till it was in the papers and then, you know. So I thought, well, what else can I do? And I thought, well, what I really, what, what I really think might work is, is to have sort of like a, create a play, uh, something that people would be uh, drawn to, interested in, and something that would, would be such a, draw so much interest that you might have it every year, kind of like the Nutcracker or something like that. I had big dreams. Uh, but the thing is, uh, nobody would fund it. Nobody would fund it. I, I got the uh, um, former executive director of the Bangor Symphony to write music for it. Because um, I was nine years on the Community Foundation. I knew people with money. Uh, nope. Couldn't get it, and I'm still trying to. Uh, the uh, uh, University of Southern Maine has finally agreed to to produce it, and I'm hoping that they will do it in the next couple of years. But we'll see. Hmm. So it's that it's so you know when you see something like a play, I know I really get into watching a play because it's something that's live. It's in front of you. You're entertained, and you learn. You know, whether you realize it or not, you're learning something. Um, and that's why it's important for Native stories to be told. And, uh, and I think the best, one of the best forms is uh, live theater or even ballet. So I want to, I'm going to ask one other, one quite, one more question here, and then I'll open it up to people who are with us if they'd like to ask a question, which you can post either in the chat box or just ask it here with us. I kind of go back to where I started, and that is, you have said in um, other settings, uh, you've described yourself as an introvert. Um, but uh, a lot of what you describe is a lot of work. It's a lot of interacting with people, um, you know, day in and day out, which can be draining for introverts. So wh wh where, where do you draw the energy from or, or the, 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 um, the drive from? in terms of the work you have done, especially the, the kind of work you've done in the legislature, which requires that kind of day after day after day interaction with people in large settings, I would imagine. Yeah, um, you know, the legislature does take a lot, of, a lot of energy and people don't understand, they don't realize how much stress a legislator is under. And, you know, I've advocated probably not loudly enough, but I, this is just an aside. I, for legislators, I think that there should be some sort of uh, uh, health program there for them, uh, something for, for meditation or just something for them to relieve their stress, even, even just checkups and stuff, uh, because it's really, it, it's hard. And, you know, we've had uh, native representatives who I, I once told Neil Rold, he said, you know, Don, how do you, how do you do, how do you cope with this stuff? You know, he said, you're, you said, you're like a, someone with their hands tied behind their back, you know, and you still have to do stuff because we, we had no vote. Um, I said, well, it's, it's hard, Neil. I, you know, it's like, it's like uh, taking a spoonful of poison and smiling as you're doing it. 
and and it is hard and and you cope with it by just getting away from it for a while and i kind of backed off uh, probably for over like a year right now from stuff and i'm just now starting to come back and the 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 current status of the relationship between the tribes and the state now is the tribes have an ambassador to the state correct yes <clears throat> Yep. And that's uh, Molly that's and my, Dana. That's my great niece, Molly and Dana. Okay. Yeah. Um, so I, I want to open it up here to some the people who joined us tonight to if, see if you have any questions for our, our guests. So I'll just open it up, you know, unmute your mic or raise your hand and we'll go from there. Um, so we have a question here that just came over the chat, which is when you were in the legislature, how did you and your counterparts or your team decide what was most important to your people? I guess, how did you prioritize? I know the collective can have their own ideas as to what's important. How did you bring those people along? Uh, how did they bring you along? You know, that's really a hard, that was a hard process because you've had the, the state has their process. They have, they have uh, uh, deadlines where they have to get the bills in, <clears throat> and they have to go to committee. These are all deadlines. Uh, the tribe, for a bill to go in, you need to get bring that in front of council. Uh, and sometimes you don't have the you don't have the time to bring it before council uh, because something might come up as as the uh, legislature is proceeding. You might have something come up. Um, but the 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 safeguard here is that the uh, these bills all have to be approved by council. So if you submit a bill, um, it, it, won't, it won't go anywhere or do anything unless the, the council approves, approves it. So. This is the, the <laughs> council of the legislature? No, no, tribal council. Tribal council, okay. That's yeah, what we're So you have a tribal for. bill. If you create a tribal bill, um, the tribe needs to approve that bill. Oh, okay. And, they, and we have a process where new bills go before a tribal council just for that, for approval. But and it's really, it's just difficult to line these things up though. Yeah, and I, I guess that you know part of the question too would be that maybe I don't know if this is what was intended in the question, but it made me think is, were there times when there were varieties of issues that are important, but you had to prioritize or perhaps say to um, people in your own community, you know what I, I know all of these are important, but for this session we're going to have to prioritize you know A, B, and C, yep. and we're going to have to set D, E, and F aside for right now. Uh, and how, well, does, how did that process well, work? In your well, you have to understand, <laughs> tribal government, I believe, tribal government is a purer democracy mm. than, than state government or, or national government. I mean, you, you say, you know, this is, this is a situation uh, we need to prioritize. If you don't, this is what I think. And uh, if, if you agree, fine. If you don't, then I just do what you tell me to do. Mm. Uh, so, I, you know, it's happened. Uh, well, I've, this may not be the same thing, but uh, there was a, uh, a bingo bill where every bingo hall in the state uh, was, they, they didn't want smoking in bingo halls. They wanted to get rid of it. They wanted to make it illegal to smoke in bingo halls. Well, I thought that was a good idea. My tribal council didn't mm. because, <laughs> because a lot of the bingo halls had smokers. And if you didn't have smokers, you wouldn't make the money. So I had, I, I represent them. Mm -hmm. So I represented them for that bill in favor of smoking mm. and we at the time we were the only uh we ended up that bill happened to be approved and the tribes were exempt from that law and they could have smokers in there in their halls mm -hmm. so you know i mean you just have to 
figure it out as you go along, I guess. Yeah, so it's, it's, it sounds like you're describing it really is a, a, a true process of community input or, or um, collective yeah. input in terms of the issues. Right. Yeah. And then that's what makes it difficult because you've got, you've got all this chaos on one side and then you've got the chaos on the other side and you're in the middle, you know. Hmm. <laughs> yeah. Other questions for our guest? Yes, Karen. <clears throat> Um, hi, Don. I don't know if you remember me, but used to work with my wife, Sue, at Bowdoin College, Sue Dano, um, oh, yeah. who just retired from the Coast Guard. So my, my, my first question is around what prompted you to join the military back in the 60s? And I have a second question, which is okay. very different. All right. So, uh, well, growing up, I would hear all of the war stories of my uncles because he they served in the military. My had an uncle in the Marines and my father in the Army, and then another one in the Air Force. And they would tell their stories. And I thought, you know, I, and also you could learn um, a trade in the, in the military. You could get out from that, uh, in well, kind of like a prison. It was, uh, you, you just there was just nothing there and there's no work there it was very um controlled and kept in poverty on purpose so in order to get out uh well in order to move forward in education and and uh, in life i guess you just had to military was one of those uh paths probably one of the easier paths to take and plus I had all my family background. So I, uh, I joined the military with the, the goal of going to Vietnam. Yeah. Cause I wanted, you know, I heard all these war stories and I thought, Hey, you know, that'd be neat. You should go there. Wrong. And your other question, Karen? Um, yeah, this may be a tough one. So you, you've, um, um, set back now for it sounds like a year what's next <laughs> that's a tough one well um my goal right now is the sovereignty topic is to um have the state recognize tribal sovereignty because they without recognizing tribal sovereignty there is no way forward together with the tribes so and, and i i truly believe that working together as partners, uh, this state could improve immensely. You know, when you look at, uh, and, I've, and I've said it and I've heard others say it, but if you look at New Mexico and Oklahoma, um, those states work well with their tribes. They have a tremendous uh, tourist, tourism industry. And uh, a few years back, I think New Mexico was bringing in something like $6 billion a year in tourism. Uh, and in Maine just is missing that boat. They're just missing the chance to work with the tribes um, and to, you know, and to improve, in, improve this, the economic status of the whole state. So that's my... Yeah. Thank you. Anyone else? Questions? Any questions for our guest? That's okay. I don't need to answer any questions. <laughs> <laughs> this is a, a question related to earlier in our conversation when I asked you about the role of women in Penobscot um, culture. Um, from your observation, what I'm always interested in um, what people in other cultures can learn from the practices of other cultures. What could other cultures, non-tribal cultures learn about the role of women in, in, in Penobscot culture? Hmm. 
Um, well, I think the the majority culture has a lot to learn about how they treat women. And I think this uh, these these things that are happening in Texas and other states and how they're treating women and telling women what to do. Well, anyway, I uh, I think that uh, I I think I think the majority culture needs to recognize the uh, the fact that that women are well women 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 are leaders they're natural leaders they really are because they they, they uh, a lot of women uh, have families and they uh i i'm having a difficult time answering that simple question um because growing up i never thought of it it sounds kind of funny but i never did <laughs> What would you say is in your in your estimation in your through your work the biggest misperception that the majority culture has about the Penobscot nation? Uh, the biggest misperception hmm. or a common misperception. Um, common misperception would be that we're not that smart, that we're lazy. Um, slow and, and that uh, we will never get ahead because we don't want to. Mm. And what, what is the majority culture, I, I guess I could say in your estimation, what is the majority culture not understanding about Penobscot culture perhaps that, that it well, I, the majority cultures uh, doesn't, un, well, what they need to understand, as I said when I first started, was that, is that we are human. We have the same needs um, as everybody else. We're not, we're not different. Uh, we, we are uh, culturally different. But we're, we're human too, and I think that that needs to be um, that needs to be recognized. The hu the, the humanness. Mm -hmm. I'll open it up uh, one last chance here for anyone who might have any questions for Donna tonight. Going once, going twice. Well, Donna, I want to thank you for making time for us tonight. Appreciate it. I want to thank you for your leadership in so many different areas, especially here in Maine, in helping advance um, advance um, your culture, raise awareness about it, helping us understand it better. Um, and I would hope on our on our behalf to be better um, allies with your community. Uh, as it see, especially as it seeks sovereignty. And I'll, I'll put a um, promotion out here. I mentioned your radio show earlier, Wabanaki um, Windows. Windows. Yep. And you've been doing a multi-part uh, series on sovereignty. Uh, so I'll recommend to people here that they go to the WERU website and find that series. I think it's a very informative series that gives a much deeper dive into this issue of sovereignty. It helped me better understand uh, the, the issues that you're that you're working for. So. Well, great. It's a, it's also a podcast too. So, great. Yes. Look, um, uh, I think yeah. it's under it's W E R's podcast, correct? Yeah. 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 So you can find it there also on your favorite podcast app. Just look for W E R U and look for Wabanaki Windows. Uh, and I said this. I think you were up this. Is it six parts now on the sovereignty? Yeah, we're getting up there. It's a, we've done. It's going to be six uh coming up and then we're going to do a seventh and i'm not sure how many more but we're going to keep going till we get some kind of make some sense out of things good okay well thank you thank yeah. you thank you for making time for us this evening and we wish you all the best in your future work